Hi Dixons, I'm Michael Feely, Principal here at Dixon City Academy. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you haven't done so already, do subscribe to our channel, use the like button and comment below to tell us which episodes you found most useful or what you'd like to see next on the channel. This video is part four of a five video mini-series and will provide a brief overview of our approach to assessment and how we use this information to shape student learning. If you haven't watched parts one to three already, please do so before watching this video. Part one covered our broad assessment principles. Part two, how we use percentile rank. And part three, how we report to parents. Part four, We'll cover how we use progress measures and part five, how the information from summative assessments is used in the classroom. We've read many blogs, articles and books on the idea of progress. This has helped us to formulate our thinking around assessment and to measure progress. However, just like our assessment principles, this is continually under scrutiny and open to debate. We started with a superb blog by Becky Allen entitled what if we can't measure pupil progress? In this blog, Becky explains the issues with trying to measure progress. She says, Measuring progress, the change in attainment between two points in time, is a recent trend, but it's very difficult to do reliably. And progress trackers, like flight paths, fundamentally don't work for many subjects. When we use tests to measure relative progress, we often look to see whether a student has moved up, good, or down bad on the bell curve. If a student achieves higher position on the bell curve or an end of year test than they did on a test taken at the start of the year, it looks like they've made good progress and learned more than similar students over the course of the year. However, the student's test scores are a noisy measure of what the student knew at the start and at the end of the year. Therefore, neither test is reliable enough to say if this student's progress is actually better or worse than should be expected giving their starting point. The challenge in measuring progress between two testing points is considerable because whether we like it or not, the progress of individual students is slow compared to the variability of achievement within the age cohort. A blog by Matthew Benyahu entitled The Difference Between Measuring Progress and Attainment resonated with our ideas on progress perfectly. He said, Measuring student progress is worse than irrelevant because intervening on progress data is frequently unjust and disadvantages those who have historically struggled at school. Suppose you find two students who get 47% in your end of year 7 history test. It isn't a great score and suggests they haven't learnt many parts of this year's curriculum sufficiently well. Will you intervene to give either of them support? The response in many secondary schools nowadays would be to interpret the 47% in relation to the Key Stage 2 data. For the student who achieved good scale scores at age 11, of around 107 for example, the 47% suggests they are not on track to achieve predicted GCSE results and so will make a negative contribution to Progress 8. Due to this, they are marked down for intervention support. The other student left primary school with a scaled score of around 94, so despite their poor historical knowledge at the end of year 7, they're still on track to achieve their own predicted GCSE results. Therefore, potentially no intervention necessary. It is deeply unjust that those who are, for whatever reasons, chance, tutoring, high quality primary school, etc., get high key stage 2 scores and then are more entitled to support than those who have identical attainment now but who once held lower key stage 2 scores. It would seem to be entrenching pre-existing inequalities in attainment. At child level, considering this model, how would you address this question from a student with lower Key Stage 2 scores? Why are they going to the intervention and I'm not? Therefore, at Dixon's, we don't want our teachers to worry too much about progress since attainment is the thing we most always want our students to know anyway. Any student towards the bottom of a cohort or class or attainment percentile rank would be prioritised for academy or leader driven or class teacher intervention in each subject. However, we still do calculate progress measure to determine if there are any students that should also be considered for intervention or celebration. On starting at a Dixon's Academy, students are awarded an age related baseline percentile rank for each subject that they study. 
we can use the baseline ranks to calculate value-added scores after each end-of-year assessment. Current approximation of performance minus baseline approximation of performance. For example, if a student is awarded a baseline rank of 38% and achieves a rank of 48% in their percentile rank, at the end of year 8, their value-added score is plus 10%. If another student is awarded a baseline rank of 47% and achieves a percentile rank of 42%, at the end of year 8, their value-added score is minus 5. As Rich Davis points out in his blog, Making the Grade, individual student grades can be very noisy, but this does become increasingly attenuated as data gets aggregated across multiple students and academies. However, Underlying differences between individual students' current performance or an individual student's performance over time can be either amplified or hidden depending on their proximity to grade boundaries. And this is before we even consider the various forms of measurement error that may influence individual students' apparent performance. Therefore, at primary, we use a buffer of negative plus 2 on a standardised score. At 11 to 15, we use plus minus 5%. And from 16 to 19, we use plus or minus one range. As mentioned, we don't share value-added scores with students and their families. However, we do use them to recognise those students who have made large shifts from their baseline. Anyone who makes significant change, which is outside the tolerance, is either prioritised for intervention, along with those students with low attainment, and those prioritised by class teachers. Using the range, we can be confident that a grade outside of this range represents a large shift from baseline. As previously mentioned, our approach to assessment is continually under review and progress is certainly an area where we've changed our approach significantly over recent years. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel and share. I hope you'll join us for part five.